This is the Crusader Industries Ares Starfighter, and it's one of two new ships recently added to Star Citizen classified as anti-capital ship heavy fighters, owing to their coaxially mounted size 7 capital class weapons. For the Inferno variant, it's a ballistic rotary cannon, and for the Ion, it's an energy-based ion cannon, both capable of delivering devastating damage to any capital class shield or system. But while they're based on the same airframe, the Inferno and Ion's employment may fit differently into different doctrines employed by fleet commanders. In this video, I'll take you through both variants, both inside and out, to help you understand how. And by the end, you'll discover what they're capable of. Just as you can discover new worlds through today's video sponsor, Audible. While I love making videos like these on the side, while also designing homes after my day job and even streaming, I hardly find any time anymore to sit down and read. So Audible has helped me to continue to spur my imagination with amazing audiobook series like The Expanse, while doing things like working out and going to the studio. I actually just finished finding out what happens to Holden and the Rosinante crew after the now-ended TV series concluded, in the audiobook Leviathan Falls by James S.A. Corey. So head on over to audible.com slash morphologist and use code morphologist or text morphologist to 500-500 and get Leviathan Falls for free and start your 30-day free Audible membership trial. And hey, if the Expand series isn't for you, you can also check out any number of their other incredible audiobooks in their massive catalog, like The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, with the one credit you'll get towards any audiobook every month as a member. At the very least, it's a great way to burn time while waiting for Patch 317 for Star Citizen. In architecture, it's sweating the details that separate the master from the novice. Every panel line, fastener, mechanical system, and even program requirements should be carefully considered as part of the narrative you want to convey. With the Ares, CIG's designers are showing off just how masterful they've become at designing ships. And it's using one of my favorite design languages in Star Citizen, the Crusader Industries design language, which is sort of a mix between beauty and utilitarian design. While well, I don't claim to be an aerospace engineer, there are a lot of winglets and little inlets that don't seem to serve any function. They don't necessarily detract, but they're superfluous. Same with exposing the engine in the back. It's not necessary. But it's all part of the narrative that Crusader is trying to tell, which is about embracing the beauty of the design while exposing some of the mechanical components to show off the heritage of Crusader, which has been building ships for many generations. What's impressive to me is that this sort of thought process about narrative about a ship in a virtual universe isn't necessary to make a ship look good, but it's something that CIG consciously chooses to do because it helps create a universe that feels like it's living and breathing, like there are actual people who are in this universe designing these ships. And that helps the designers understand how the language is translated into other ships to develop a consistency, and it helps guide them so that they don't spend too much time designing things that don't necessarily help push the narrative forward about Crusader Industries and the lore and the universe of Star Citizen. Notice how the shape language of stuff like the Mercury Star Runner and the C2 all share something in common with the Ares. They all have shape language relationship, color relationship. Even the engines are almost directly borrowed on each ship. The result is that when you look at the Ares, you understand that this is a Crusader ship, and that's what makes it so good. This is the Ares Ion, by the way, which is the other variant of the Ares Starfighter. One of the other wonderful things they've also started doing with these newer ships is considering more carefully the user and what they're going to need. For ships like this where you don't have a cabin, there needs to be a place for you to store things like extra suits and materials, components for repairing, or maybe even some extra ammunition, and even perhaps a place to store your weapon. And so the Ares has a storage unit on the back utilizing the new storage system that they added in 315. And it also has a physicalized weapon locker, which does actually work. In the future, when you're only able to equip a flight suit while sitting in a small cockpit like the Ares, it's going to become necessary to have have a place like this to store these items so they don't get in the way of you getting into your cockpit. And so I love how they've integrated the solution into the design of these newer ships. And yeah, if you're curious, they're going to be doing this on all single-seater fighters going into the future as they pass each ship through its gold standard pass, such as what they've recently done with the Sabre and the Gladius. 
But now I want to shift over to functionality and explain how these details will affect the way that you're able to utilize this ship in combat, because they're going to play a big part in both the strengths and the weaknesses of the Starfighter in the field. If you haven't been following Star Citizen for a while, you may be unaware that there's been a big push by CIG designers to start adding in a lot of the systems that they talked about early on, like physicalized components. And so for ships like the Starfighter, there are actual physical locations to each component, which are directly vulnerable to fire from ballistic weapons and even energy weapons if the shields go down far enough. While this is incredibly impressive from a game standpoint, it has real implications for how you're able to get into combat with it. And it's the same design intent that informed where these modules go that informed the design of the cockpit, which you'll find is smaller than you may have expected for the size of the ship. And that comes down to the fact that most of the ship needs to be components in order to run the size 7. But one of the other key things you'll notice about this cockpit is that its visibility is pretty limited vertically and to the rear. Once again, this comes back to the designer's intent with this ship. It's not designed to be a dogfighter, it's meant to go up against capital ships. So let's hop into space and get into some combat and I'll explain exactly what I mean and how this will affect how you employ it on the battlefield. In their element, the Inferno and Ion are both truly terrifying opponents for any capital ship pilot. They can tear through shields faster than most any other ship in the game and pretty quickly start knocking off armor plates and engines, effectively crippling a ship. The problem comes if you try to dogfight with it like any other ship you might have flown. Its size 7 is understandably going to melt any fighter, unfortunate enough to get hit by it, but running a size 7 capital ship weapon comes at a pretty steep cost. Size 7s, first of all, require big, powerful components in order to run them, which equates to a lot of volume in the airframe for the mechanicals. As the Ares is designed to attack capital ships with massive, powerful weapons capable of one-shotting most small ships, the designers had to reduce the attack profile as much as possible by essentially flattening the ship. This forced pretty much all of the components to the surface of the ship, making them highly susceptible to being pinpoint targeted by good pilots. It also means that if you decide to get into a turning battle with a fighter, you're going to have some problems when you provide a massive target to your opponent if they gain positional advantage. Finally, and equally as important, these big components also equate to more mass and thus more directional inertia to overcome. This has resulted in the Ares having a rather sluggish handling characteristic, putting you at a pretty big disadvantage in any turning battle with a light, medium, or even conventional heavy fighter like the Vanguard. However, that doesn't mean that you can't get into a dogfight with the Ares. In fact, I actually have had a lot of fun doing so against people like John Crew, who ran away. But to be honest, I can't really blame him, because I killed half his ship team. Take that for changing the Carex engine design! But anyway, if you find yourself up against fighters, you'll want to avoid getting into a turning fight at all costs, and instead use your range and speed to your advantage. The ship is really quick. The Psi 7 is powerful, but being coaxial means that it has absolutely no aim assist or gimbal assist like other fixed weapons. To mitigate this problem, I'd recommend you fly directly at your opponent as much as possible in quick passes. In other words, jousting. Because the range is so long with a size 7, you'll have a good amount of time on target with your opponent versus other conventional weapons which have a much more limited damage range. However, if you do choose to orbit your opponent, keep at around a 3-5 km range which will put you out of reach of most light fighter weapons. You also want to yaw as much as possible to keep distance instead of pitching because you don't want to present that big target with all your modules. Finally, if you do lose shields in combat, you're going to want to get out of there as quickly as possible. I can't tell you how many times I've lost control of the Ares after the shields went down as the components can so easily take damage. Should you instead choose to use it for its intended purpose against capital ships though, they're best used in groups doing passing runs. At the moment, NPC capital ships are pretty easy to deal with as they don't really select primaries like they did initially because they discovered that it was a little too OP. But as we move towards bigger ships manned by players, you're going to want to avoid doing orbits with this ship as it's not very good at tanking. Finally though, you may wonder which variant of the two you should choose, the Ion or the Inferno. I think this comes down to personal preference and doctrine. 
The Ion provides a big alpha strike accurately and has the ability to stay in the fight much longer because it doesn't need to go back and rearm. But it does come with the disadvantage that it doesn't have as much sustained DPS as the Inferno, nor does it have the ability to easily strike through shields at components. The Ares Inferno, on the other hand, is less accurate, relying on volume instead of accuracy, and has a huge boost to sustain DPS to compensate, and the ability to ignore shields completely and destroy ship components if the shields go low enough. The downside, of course, is that because it's ballistic, it only has 3,800 rounds, so you'll be dry in just a few minutes of sustained fire. Finally, moving on to their employment on the battlefield for a commander who wants to create a wing of these things, a wing of infernos I think will be better suited for quick, fast attacks where you know the target and you want to get them down quick. However, if you're more unsure of your target and the situation is more fluid, you're better suited to use the ion as it can stay in the fight a lot longer and engage more targets despite the fact that it puts out less DPS. Personally though, I enjoy the drama of the inferno, but I understand the practicality of the ion. So when it comes to which one you choose, I leave that decision to you. I've been Morphologist, thanks for watching. And remember that if you're looking for a great way to kill some time with a great story while you wait for the next patch for Star Citizen, check out Audible and use code Morphologist at audible.com slash Morphologist or text Morphologist to 500, 500 to get your free Leviathan Falls audiobook. See you next time.